Hi, welcome to the Catholic Corner. I'm Monsignor Walter Nolan. We have an incredible two-part series that we'll be doing on the Catholic Corner this time and, and the next time. I say incredible because I had the wonderful opportunity to share an interview with Sister Alga Yakov. Sister is just a remarkable human person who became a religious sister. Sister Alga was born and raised in Iraq. She felt the calling to the religious life at a very, very early age, somewhere around 14. Just kind of think about that a little bit. A young girl in Iraq, age 14, who wants to become a religious Catholic sister. And she went from that calling to 1996, when she started her own religious order called the Missionaries of the Virgin Mary. Sister Alga was the first woman who could ever study at the seminary in Iraq, St. John's Seminary. And when she applied and will hear her story, of course they said, no, no women can study here. And not only did she study, but she got the highest marks in the whole seminary. Now, Sister Alga is in our country studying on scholarship at Boston College. She's also the campus, Catholic campus minister at Boston University. I had an opportunity to share not just words with Sister Alga, but I really felt that I was in the presence of a very, very beautiful, holy woman, a saint in our own times, a saint in, in, in what she does and, and how she shares it. See, she came here to the, our diocese, the Diocese of Trenton, because she was going to speak at our diocesan youth conference. In this first part of our two-part series, I talked with Sister Alga about her calling to religious life and the tremendous, many, many difficulties that she faced along the way. Difficulties of, of a woman, difficulties of parents, difficulties of a culture that didn't fully understand. She also shared with me some of the stories about her ministry to prisoners in Iraq, where only 3% of the population is Christian. When I tell you that I was in awe just sharing some time and thoughts and, and in a sense prayer with Sister Alga, I really feel that you're going to feel the same way when you hear her speak, when you start to realize and contemplate, and I hope you do that during, this, during our show, that you contemplate the great Holy Spirit of God and how the Spirit works all over the world and how I think the Spirit unites us and how I think the Spirit through people like Sister Alga will eventually bring peace to our countries, to our world, and hopefully to all men and women who seek the freedom to do the will that they want and to be whom God wants them to be. Let's meet Sister Alga. Um, your last name is Jacob. Did I pronounce that correct? That's correct. beautiful. Yes. And you told me I think that means Jacob. Yes, it is. Oh, my gosh, that's, that's just a beautiful name and a beautiful tradition. Tell me a, a little bit about your background. Uh, I understand you're a youth minister in Iraq. Yes. Yes, I am a youth minister in Iraq. Uh, I started especially this ministry after the first Gulf War because I felt um, after almost two wars at that time, the first war with Iran eight years and then the war in Kuwait and um, when they started the first Gulf War, I felt the youth were almost hopeless, um, especially the generation that you know grew up in, in those wars. Um, they were children and then teenagers and watching just all the pictures of war and dead and um, they were, they were hopeless and I felt that they need a special ministry, someone to um, give them hope and uh, hope in faith and that they are loved by God even if they didn't experience um, that love from the rest of the world because um, all what they experienced was uh, people fighting and killing and because of all those wars uh, many teenagers and youth they couldn't even go to school so they end up even with no education with with nothing you know um, so they were, as I say, they were hopeless. So I felt that they need a special ministry. Because of that, I, I, I started this ministry at that time. Even I was a laywoman. Uh, but I felt they need a special care. Uh, children and teenagers who have um, been growing in, in that kind of condition. Now, would most of these youth be Catholic, Christian, or did you invite all the, any youth that would like to come and 
and share you know, your work and your love? You know, first we started with Christian Catholics um, youth, but because um, in Iraq, because it's Islamic country, as you know, like 97% of the population are Muslim. So we don't have like specific town or city only for Christian people. We live like neighbors together. Um, so when they saw that all the activities and different things that we were doing for the um, our Christian Catholics um, youth, uh, they started like their friends asking them at school or or you know, some of them who they were able to go to school, or just neighbors, can we come, can we join you, you know, just, just to have that hope, that, um, that sense that there is something different in life um, than just watching you know, pictures of war. Or what a great sign of God's kingdom taking roots uh, Amen. where we certainly need it. Amen, amen, Gosh. yes. Now you started this as a laywoman, yes. and now you're a beautiful sister. Praise God, I'm grateful <laughs> to God. <laughs> we, will, we will always praise God for that, sister. Tell me a little bit about your religious uh, life. Uh, how and when did you know you wanted to be a sister? And how did you get called? Um, actually, I was very young when I wanted to be uh, a religious sister. I was only 14 years old, but uh, at that time, my parents didn't agree with my my desire to be a religious sister. Um, first of all, because um, you know, in in my culture, uh, boys and girls they don't go to school together until we we go to college. Um, the high schools or elementary schools, they all, you know, always separated. So at that time, my parents thought that I'm too young to decide that I want to be a religious sister. They say, uh, I'm one of the five girls in my family. And like any parents, I think everywhere they want to see their girls getting married. And especially in, in some our... grandchildren? Yes. And especially in our culture, um, yes, it's, um, I mean, my family always were Christian. But growing up in, in Islamic and Arab environment, um, their beliefs is more that women has to get married and have family and raise ch children. This is why God created her. So at that time, like one of their five daughters telling, no, I don't want to get married. I want to be religious and I want to go to convent, like was something very new for my, my parents to hear that, and especially in a very young age. So um, the first thing they told me, wait to finish high school. When you go to college, you will meet the man of your life. You will change your mind. So they didn't uh, accept my decision at that time because of my age, first of all. Um, but um, the more I prayed about it, and I was very involved from a very young age in the church always, um, I got, you know, in in a deeper love with God. And I felt like um, with all my respect and, and I admire the, the sacrament of, of marriage and the, the union between men and, and women. Um, but I felt no man can take any, any place in my heart because I felt that always God was jealous of, you know, for my heart. Um, then when I get um, a senior high school, I told to my parents again, there is no sense to wait to finish high school. I do feel it that you know, I have a call from God. They didn't accept, so I ran away from home for the first time. And I went to the convent of um, uh, Sisters of Immaculate Conception, where the only sisters that I knew in my town where I grew up. Uh, but in my culture, again, because of you know our Islamic Arab culture, even as a um, religious communities, they don't accept a woman bef uh, without written permission of her parents. So the mother superior asked me if I have a, a letter from my parents. I told her, no, I ran away from home because my parents don't want me to be religious. So she immediately called my parents and she took me back home. And my parents, because they were afraid, like, um, in my culture also, like a young woman would never leave the house without her parents and would never even live alone as a even adult woman. Um, she leaves her parents' home to her husband's home. Married. This is all what, you know, uh, she can do. Um, so for them, like in that age doing that, they thought that she's crazy. She will do it again. So immediately I finished, uh, after I finished high school, um, my, all my sisters who graduated af before me, um, my father said, we don't need your degree to go to college. He hired them with him in the oil company because where I grew up in Kirkuk, they have a big, huge oil company. But when I finished, he said, no, we will send you to college. He sent me far away from home just to take me away from the sisters um, to, to study college. And um, they thought that in those years I might change my mind. And I studied, my first major was um, uh, biology and hematology. And after five years, I came back home and I told him, okay, you know, Dad, I went to college. I, I met wonderful men. They're all good friends of mine. But still my heart is just 
just belonged to God and no one else. And at that time was um, at the beginning of uh, the Gulf War. So my father said, uh, it's a dangerous situation to wait here because of the war. And you have only one brother and we have to run away from the country to save your brother. Um, so we, we left at the beginning to, to run away from war, but wasn't possible because was already war you know, began at that time. Um, so we stuck in the desert for a couple months and then some of us were able to go back, some of us not. Um, and then I end up in Jordan with my brother to help him to, to leave the country. And um, I, I got him a visa to England, but my father said he's too young, he was only 14. He said, you have to go with him in order to make sure that he's okay. And then I heard from my brother that wasn't just to help him, but in my culture also they arrange marriage for you know, the girls. And I realized that I was engaged without knowing. And this was the project where my parents were sending me to England with my brother. And I prayed on that day a lot to, to, to see God as guidance because I tried to obey his commandments, to, to obey my parents, to respect their desires. But at the same time, the desire to be um, a religious sister was so strong in my heart that I didn't have any single doubt that wasn't from God. And I prayed a lot, especially to the Blessed Mother, and um, which she has been always my mother. Uh, and I felt um, her strong support in my heart, that if I leave, she will be always with me, and this is where her son is calling me. So I wrote a letter in Jordan to my parents, and um, I took only my passport and little money to take a bus and went back to Baghdad. And that was the second time I left my family. But that time was for good because uh, they accept me dead for a long time because for them I didn't obey their desire. Um, just recently they did accept my religious vocation, but for years they didn't allow me to communicate them or know anything about them um, because they were um, angry. My father said, um, you love the church more than your family. They love the church, my family, but for them it just was something it's huge hard. what I did. Yes. Um, so for three years when I went back to Baghdad, I worked as a lay person uh, because I didn't have a written permission so any community couldn't accept me of my parents. And working for a long time with, with the handicap of war and prisoners of war after the first Gulf War, um, finally I got a permission from uh, a bishop in Baghdad to start a new religious community. Um, so this is briefly a short so history. So that's, that's how you started your own community? Yes. Yeah. No other community would take you, so you just said, okay, I'll start my own. Uh, no, actually, like, wasn't just because of that, but um, I think the, you know, God has, has different ways of working uh, His plans in our lives. Um, I felt not being accepted in other religious communities. He was preparing me to this step. Uh, I, I definitely prayed about it and it was um, um, a clear sign that he was preparing me for this step. I never dreamed or hoped to be uh, a founder of a community, um, but I, I did it not because I, I was able to do it, but because I, I have trust totally in him. That it's his work. No wonder your name is Jacob. <laughs> That's much, uh, just a beautiful story of God and a beautiful story of yourself. You now, your, your religious order is Missionaries um, of the Virgin Mary. Yes, I, I wanted the order to be named after the Blessed Mother and I wanted the community to be uh, uh, missionaries because I felt that uh, there is so much needs everywhere and we have to be open to the Holy Spirit wherever God wants us to go um, to do the mission of, of love and mercy and give hope to people. And uh, specifically, uh, I wanted to the community to be named after her and even the feast of our community and all our sisters they um, they receive their habit they make vows on the two feasts of the blessed mother the um, assumption and uh, the annunciation uh, sorry uh, the immaculate conception Isn't that terrific now how many sisters do you have um, uh, we have now seven sisters because it's a very small community a new community um, the um, the official date that we um, got the, the permission from the Patriarch of the Assyrian Church, Assyrian Catholic Church, was in 1996. Um, because I needed for two years for myself to do formation with the Dominican Sisters of Presentation before I made my, uh, my vows. And then uh, we got a house and um, 
we accepted women in, in that community and I started Formation House for them. Do, do they have to have written permission from their, from their parents? I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Are there a lot of uh, Catholic religious in Iraq? Um, now, all Christian together, I could say um, they are almost 3% of the population. All Christians? All Christians mm -hmm. together, um, Catholics and Orthodox. Um, but the church is very alive in, in, in Iraq. And I guess maybe as I hear, hear from people, it's the same almost in many poor countries or people who, um, who live in a poor condition, um, they, they, they experience that the only richness that they have is the church and their faith. So you see a lot of vocations in Iraq, a lot of seminarians, religious uh, sisters and brothers, and um, every year hundreds of kids receive First Communion. Um, so the, the church is very strong and it's very alive in Iraq. Is it pretty well spread throughout Iraq or are there certain areas or pockets where it's it's more possible to... Mostly are in North, actually, mm -hmm. and we have also in Baghdad, which we have the Roman Catholic also um, diocese. Uh, the Archbishop uh, is in Baghdad, this, the capital city. Very few you find in, in the South. Mm -hmm. South is most uh, Islamic area, and um, most of the population there are Shias. Are, are the uh, Christian Catholics free to practice their faith? or? Um, before this recent war, we were very free, yes. Um, uh, I, I served in the prison of Abu Ghraib for um, seven years before I came to United States, um, and I visited them as a religious sister. I, I, I served them as a religious sister. They were open to my, my ministry there for them, and they all were Muslim people in, in the prison. Uh, but after this recent war, as you all have heard, um, has created kind of... Um, it, it's bad because I feel like it's, it's for political reason, but um, a lot of people have also um, took it as a religious reason, um, this, this recent war. Um, so uh, has, this war has created division, I could say, that we didn't experience it before this war. Um, there is a lot of attacks now against Christian, Iraqi Christian. Uh, and also, I am sure you have heard the news, was a lot of attacks uh, on many churches. And just last, um, was uh, almost a month ago when they kidnapped even a bishop mm -hmm. of Syrian Catholic Church in Mosul. So now it's, it's been challenged for Christian people of Iraq uh, because some of the um, Islamic people or groups that they are now in Iraq, um, they think that it's, it's a religious war, it's not politics war. Growing up in an area like that, that was predominantly uh, Islam, that's helped you in your in your in your work. Yeah, I never experienced any difficulties growing up. Um, I came to this country uh, when I was 34. So in 34 years of my life, growing up as a Christian in Muslim country, I never experienced any difficulties, any challenges. Our Muslim neighbors, I had. You know, we weren't like in a town, completely Christian town. We had a lot of Muslim neighbors, Kurdish, Turkish, Arab people. Um, they always enjoyed our Easter, our Christmas. Uh, uh, we we got together uh, every Christmas and Easter to make like Christmas cookies, uh, Easter cookies. And they were, you know, all the families, neighbors, getting together with us to help us in our uh, big feast days. And same thing we did for them in their Ramadan, you know, their feast days. Um, so we were, we were like a family, the whole town, um, whether Muslim or Christian. Um, but now it's different, and I, I, I feel like one of the um, you know, bad results of war is this division that now we are experiencing in Iraq, which we never had before. Maybe we have to get back to sharing more cookies then with each other. Maybe that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Gosh. Now, Sister, you, you studied uh, Islam and Judaism? Yes, yeah. Um, because after, after I came back to Iraq uh, and I started doing ministry, um, I, 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 I saw that God is way in, in calling me to do all those studies. Uh, was one of them. He opened a door of ministry for me that I, um, when I went back, I wasn't accepted by any of the relatives because I, I 
they thought that I disobeyed my parents. Um, so I ended up living with homeless for many years. And uh, that experience of living with homeless for three years, um, they weren't like only Christian homeless, were you know, Muslim people from different denominations. And I felt that in order to serve those people and to help them, I needed to know more about their faith, about their religions. Um, and it wasn't possible, like everybody thought that I was crazy, like you are a Christian woman, why you wanna study Quran? Uh, because I studied Islamic science, uh, because I wanted to know more about you know, their religions and their beliefs. Um, and then because um, I realized that we all, you know, from the same, we all um, children of Abraham, we all from the same background, so I wanted to study even Judaism. Then I, um, I wanted to study even theology, and at that time wasn't possible. In Islamic country, at that time, we didn't have school of theology at all. The only place they used to teach theology was the seminary, and was only for seminarians. And I wasn't even a religious sister. But when I heard about you know, uh, that place that they teach theology there, and through that they teach a lot uh, about Judaism, and I went and I met with the director of the seminary, and I told him, I want to study theology. and. Uh, he said, like, we don't give uh, classes to women because it's only seminary. But I told him, if you just give me a chance for one semester and I will prove you know, to you why I want to do that, it's very important for my mission and my ministry. So they gave me a chance for one semester and they wanted to see how can, you know, how can I manage you know, study theology there. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful all years of my life to the, to the grace of the Holy Spirit because I do believe when you are called from God to do any kind of mission, no matter how limited you are, the grace of God will give you the strength to accomplish that mission. And God helped me to not only study one semester, but I studied six years at St. John Seminary in, in Iraq with the seminarians. And I was the, the first lay woman started studying there. And then I became a religious in my first year of theology. Because as you know, Monsignor, in the seminary, they teach two years philosophy and then four years theology. So I did six of them. And not only that, but grace of God um, helped me at the last year. Uh, the Holy Father has been always so good to the Catholic Church of Iraq, to all people of Iraq, but particularly for the Catholic Church and to the seminarians. At that time, uh, our um, school of theology at the seminary got accepted to be affiliated with Orbaniana University in Rome and to encourage the seminarians because they were, I mean, suffering in many years in Iraq. So to give them kind of, you know, more courage to, to study and to be good priests to serve the people of Iraq, um, they gave them opportunity, whoever will get the highest score in graduation uh, will get a scholarship master and PhD in Urbaniana University in Rome. And I was, I was amazed. I wasn't surprised because um, I, I mean, I have seen a lot of graces in my life by power of God, but he always amazes me because, um, you know, I know I'm not worthy for all those blessings, um, but I was amazed that I was the one who got the highest score in, in 2000. And because you know, of that... I, I knew you were going to say that. And because of that, I got the scholarship from the Jesuit Society to come to Boston College. Isn't that great? So you didn't go study in Rome, you came up to Boston um, College. I got two scholarships, to, and they wrote to my bishop about them, and my bishop suggested to come to the United States. Well, we're, we're blessed that you, that you came here. I'm blessed Boston to be here. Boston College is a, is a beautiful place. What did, you, uh, what did you hope to do at Boston College? Um, I'm so grateful to God for this opportunity because for me growing up in the environment where I was, um, first obviously I didn't know English, I learned English in Boston. I took four courses at Boston University. Um, so this is a, a great opportunity to learn a new language because I believe every language that you learn will help you to communicate with people in a better way. And every communication, it's a new sign of hope to have peace with people. Um, and especially, I feel, was it's all like I, f I, I see the hidden hand of God in every single day of my life. Um, like even the way that he sent me to the seminary and then to get the highest score and then to get scholarship. And the way even he brought Jesuit at that last year in Iraq, 
like if, if they didn't come to teach us two courses where two Jesuits came from this uh, province of Boston College, um, they just came by invitation of the director of the seminary to teach two courses there. And was my last year there. And I met them and uh, when I got the highest score, they said, well, we would love to have you at Boston College. And that just happened the last semester of the last year that I was there. So coming here, I feel that God um, brought me here for a reason. Yes, through, through study, but I don't feel that that was the main reason. But I feel like he brought me here and he gave me the grace to learn this language, which I didn't know anything about it before. And then um, he gave me the opportunity um, to, to be in United States at the time that he, he knew what was happening you know, between our nations and our countries. And I always say, he sent me to a state that has no Iraqi community. Like if he sent me to Chicago, there is a large Iraqi community there, Detroit and California. But he sent me to Boston because I always say, especially to the high school kids, to make me fall in love with Americans. Sister Alger is just the kind of person that you want to spend time with. You know, when she talked to the high school students, as she said, make me fall in love with Americans. When well, you, know, you talk to Sister Alga and you fall in love with Iraqians, you talk to Sister Alga and you fall in love with all people of God. Sister Alga is that kind of a person that allows you to understand what, what Jesus was really all about. The sacrament of, of ourself, to make us sacraments to each other. Certainly, I think the good Lord had a tremendous wonder about her vocation, a vocation that calls us all to be one people of God, to be one in understanding what faith really is all about. I look at Sister Alger and I smile because I, she's the kind of woman who can say, you know, I ran the race, I ran it pretty well, didn't I? And she still runs that race. She's the, she's the person that can understand what Eucharist really is, to, to be chosen by God, to be filled with God's Holy Spirit, to be broken in a sense, but always so that she can be given, given to her work with young people, given to her work with her own dear loved ones in Iraq, but allowing us to be given so that we too can always share the, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the one who calls us. Next week, I'll also have a, another interview with Sister Alga. This time we'll be talking a little bit about her notions of peace and how she can bring peace to to our own homeland in Iraq. And she'll talk about the importance of prayer and certainly the Eucharist in her life. Sister Alga is an inspiring person and I hope and pray that she come back to us next time so that we can pray together. The Catholic Corner, Post Office Box 5147, Trenton, New Jersey, 08638. Call us 609-406-7402. Bless you. Pray with us. Love your God, because your God loves you.